What's going on, guys? We are live, and today we're going to be talking about water. Water is essential, and you need to have some plans for water, whether you're a prepper or not. And so we're going to look at some different things about water, uh, different ways to treat it, different effects that dehydration have on you, and just a lot of different things. In fact, water is a pretty big subject, so we're going to have a lot to talk about today. Um, we do want to thank Sportsman's Guide for sponsoring today's episode, and you get $20 off every $100 or more purchase using Such, just S-O-O-T-C-H. We can't put a link down below in the description, but if you go to Sportsman's Guide, you can throw it in there. If you're part of their buyer's club, you get free shipping, but you also get a discounted price, and it pays for itself in no time. I use it all the time personally. <laughs> so uh, check out Sportsman's Guide and we really appreciate them. Uh, Robbie's not going to be with us here today. He is on vacation. So it's just me and Sarah Max over monitoring the questions and comments. And uh, we'll take a little break at one point and take your comments and your questions. And so we've just got a lot to talk about. Guys, one of the things about water is your body is made up of 60% water. The earth is made up of 71% water. And so water is essential. In fact, in the rule of threes, you can only live three days without water. So you need water <laughs> and we all know that we need water, but there's a lot of questions about water. And sometimes we just don't think about some of the outlying things. And that, that's really one of the big reasons I wanted to talk about water today. Now, one of the big things about water dehydration uh, you know, and obviously one of the ways is when you're going to the bathroom and it's really dark, <laughs> you know that you haven't drank enough water. And honestly, the older you get, the less thirsty you tend to be. So sometimes you can be dehydrated and not even be thirsty. And so it's very important that we drink. Now, one of the things that I've learned over the past few years, and, and as I get older, I'm more susceptible to heat. And so I was at the range a couple of years ago. I was, I'm one of those kind of guys that goes, you know, this, you know, hiding inside because it's hot is for wimps and I'm out at the range and I'm going all day long in the, just the sun. And it was about 90 degrees, uh, you know, and I had a little bit to drink, but I just really didn't have enough. When I got home, my body actually started to cramp. My toes started cramping. I just felt very lethargic. I was very tired. And, you know, it just really took a toll on me. And so if you get out and you overexert yourself without hydration, you really can endanger yourself. Now, one of the problems, again, is that you're not thinking about it. And in a self in a self defense, in a, a grid down situation and a self defense situation or somewhere where there is a disaster, regardless if it's a natural disaster or if it's a man-made disaster, is you are working, you are moving, you are doing things. And so you're exerting yourself. And so really having enough water to be able to keep you hydrated is the key. So one of the big things about water too, is that it shuts down your kidneys if you stop using, if you stop drinking. And, and you need to be in good shape. Uh, you know, while you're doing this. So you don't want to be sick. You don't want to be dehydrated. You don't want to be lethargic and having cramps in a SHTF situation. Uh, also, it's just really tough on your body. And one of the things about it too, is you start getting sick. And then one of the ways that you get really dehydrated is when you get sick, whether it's diarrhea, vomiting. I mean, you can really lose all your hydration. And, you know, when you're ill, when you have a fever, those kind of things. So it's really good to stay in good, healthy shape, especially during these times. So water is vulnerable. And, you know, we have had different places in the country over the past year that where their water systems were tainted. Uh, they were found poison in the water. They've had to shut the water down. They went through a boil, you know, a mandatory boil with all drinking water. And so, we're going to look at some different ways to take care of water. We're going to talk about some really convenient ways, but we're going to talk about some of the necessities. Now, number one, and probably the best way to filter your water or to get rid of bacteria is to boil it. And so you boil it for about uh, one minute, boil it for a minute. 
If you live in elevations over 6,000 feet, you boil it for three minutes. Now, one of the things about boiling water is sometimes, you know, you may have sediment in the water. It's according to where you're getting it. If you're still able to access water through your tap, if you're able to get a hold of water, you know, typically it's going to be at least clear. And you may need to go ahead and boil it to get rid of Giardia, Cryptosporidium. There's a lot of different compounds. If you think that you can look, go down to your creek, we have a stream right here at the house. It's beautiful. It's clear. It, it comes over a waterfall. I mean, it's gorgeous. But we don't know what's going on upstream. And with water, you don't know. So never drink directly out of a stream. Uh, you should always have some way to filter that water. Now, if you're going to boil your water and you're getting it out of a stream, out of a lake, out of some kind of water source that you don't really know about, uh, you know, sometimes it has sediment. Sometimes it's, it's fogged up. Sometimes it's cloudy. And so one of the things that I like to do is to take some kind of cotton cloth and pour in what I call pre-filter. So you pour that water through there and you get a lot of the sediment and things like that out of it. And so that way that you have less in your container. A second thing is if it's really cloudy is just let it set for a little bit and the, the debris and everything will start to settle. And then you can pull the water off the top and get that clear water off the top. That way you can boil that water. Another thing about boiling water is taste. And if you're just getting water out of a different source, sometimes it can have a flavor to it or a taste. And water with flavor, unless you have some kind of citrus flavor, is <laughs> not good. And so one of the things that they recommend is to take just a pinch of salt for every quart. And it'll actually make the water taste better. Uh, so those are just some ways we're just boiling water. Now, another way to take care of water is your bleach. And you need just regular household bleach. Uh, it needs to be just unscented. And what you do is you take about an eighth of a tablespoon or eight little droplets for each gallon. You drop it in there and you let it sit for about 30 minutes. Just let it sit there. Let it just settle in. You want to stir it up. Uh, one good way to do it, too, is to take that water after you do it and pour it into another container. That oxygenates the water. It helps to get it, you know, in good shape. And then, again, there's another, another way that's really common are iodine pills. Now, one of the things about iodine, which the military for years was using iodine pills, uh, it does affect the taste. But one of the big keys to it is it does not kill cryptosporidium. And that's one thing that's a microorganism that can really make you sick. And also, if you have someone that's pregnant or someone that has thyroid issues or has an allergy toward iodine, then iodine is not really one of the best. In fact, honestly, we have some iodine pills that we keep put back, but that is one of my last choices. Uh, number two, it doesn't take out the sediment. It doesn't take out the taste and it adds a little bit of taste. And so, you know, that is one thing that you want to do. Now, there's another thing, and I'm going to have to look at it because, uh, yeah, chlorine dioxide tablets. That's another way to be able to, to kill the bacteria and put them, you know, just put them in. You can go by the instructions and really on, on all these things, do your research, you know, find out what you need to do. Just like with the Clorox, you don't want to put too much Clorox or bleach is really is what I should say. You shouldn't put too much bleach in your water. Uh, it can have adverse effects. So you have just an, enough amount, again, one eighth of a tablespoon. And so those are kind of ways to treat your water. Now, let me just make a note here that if you have a Brita water filter, that is not enough to be able to treat untreated water. If you're pulling it out of your tap and you want to make it taste better, that's fine. But if you're counting on some kind of commercial household in your kitchen filter system, that is not going to work with water that you may have to pull from a stream, you may have to pull from a creek or a lake. And I'm sure that many of you have seen, especially lakes, sometimes I wouldn't want to drink that water even if it was filtered, but I have, I've done it, I've tested it. And so being able to filter those waters or treat those waters is really probably the basic, probably something easy to do. And it's probably the least expensive, especially with your bleach or with boiling water. And again, boiling water is one of the best ways to make sure that you're killing all those microorganisms and you boil it for one minute. Okay, now next is would be your filter systems. 
there's a lot of different filters out there. Uh, you know, many of you have seen the life straws. Those are big. Uh, some of my favorites are actually the Frontier filter straws. Now, this is a pro and this is really more for hiking if I'm, I'm going light. Also, I like the standard filter straw. I keep these in our packs and it's something that's really lightweight. It goes in our go bag. And so it just makes it easy to have water available that we can use to be able to drink. And if you're on the go, there's one thing you need some kind of container as well to be able to store the water. Uh, with this, you just go down to a creek, you put the head into the water, you just suck through the straw and you can get your water. But if you leave that water source, you know, you don't have that portable water. And so being able to have that portable water. Now, let's just say that you're in your home. Uh, well, now let me let me don't skip on filters here. This is the uh, Berkey sport bottle. It has one of the Berkshire charcoal filter systems in here. It's actually in it. There are different ones that have a filter set up and it has the container right here. So you can drop this in and you can move on and then you can drink from there. Um, and then of course there's the Katadines. There's the, I mean, there's a ton of different ones, the Sawyer minis, all those. Most of those though, typically are for, you know, if you're out in the woods, if you're walking, if you're hiking, if you're camping, but it still comes in handy to at least have some kind of filter system in case something happens. And two, this will help the taste of the water over just putting it in Clorox, boiling the water and treating it with maybe iodine. So this could be an option for that. Now for filters though, our number one choice for water filtration is the Berkey. And this is the big Berkey. We have had this for about 10 years and we have used it every day. You fill up the reservoir, there are these filter systems that come open up. I'm going to kind of show it to you. You can see these black filters that are in here. Each one of these filters will filter 3000 gallons of water. There's two filters in the standard Big Berkey. It's all stainless steel. And then there's a reservoir here at the bottom and there's a spigot. Now we have made all of our tea whenever we cook and we get it right out of a tap and then we filter it that way. But if you're taking raw water, water from a creek or some kind of other source, you really need to pre-filter the water to protect your filters. So you kind of clean out the sediment, get that taken care of. Again, if it's cloudy, let that settle down to the bottom and then take the clear water, put it in your reservoir. And guys, this is one of our go-to water filtration systems. This is what we use. Now there are household, you can't have them attached to your, to your water system and you can do that. You know, it just costs, but you know, if you, your water is that important, it's really priceless. But now we have switched from this to going to the Imperial. We have a really large Berkey. In fact, we can take water out of our pool and uh, filter it. That is one of our preps is our pool water. And what's really funny is that the chlorine in your pool is typically less chlorine content than it is in your tap water, but you still need to filter it because people have been swimming in it and everything else. Uh, but that is a great way to, to have portable water is a pool. So filter systems, guys, that is vital in this whole scenario or having some way to treat your water. And you need to make sure that you have those down. Uh, one of the things about this filter system, again, even with our Imperial, is it has four filters. We can filter 12,000 gallons of water. And again, we use it every day. In fact, I can't even drink water out of a tap anymore. It just makes me sick. And that ought to tell you something about our water system. But again, water systems are vulnerable and they can be tainted. Uh, somebody can actually do it on purpose and include chemicals or something in there. And guys, with a lot of the things that are going on now, even with cyber attacks, people are, they have no dis, they have no regard for human life when it comes to this kind of stuff. So getting back to these basics and water is one of the most basic. And really, I think this runs about $225, 250. It's very well worth it. Okay. We're going to go ahead. If you have a, do we have a few questions? Do we have some things that if you do have some questions, throw them out there and we'll kind of keep them. Uh, Sarah Mack will let me know when we have it. Now, another thing to do is just to go to the store and pick up gallon jugs or your water bottles and just stock this water up because this is a really easy way. And one of the things about this kind of water, and we noticed this with when COVID-19 first happened, 
uh, right there at the beginning of 2020 is a lot of the things that we had long ter long term prepped, we had stored. You know, we weren't at the point where we wanted to get into that. We were still in convenience mode. So it's really easy at first. And you do want to have some convenience, especially at the beginning of an SHTF type situation or some kind of natural disaster. And so having some kind of water that's potable, that's ready to drink, and you can easily just pour it into a glass and drink it is vital. Now, you need one gallon of water per day per person, but you also need water for sanitation. And sanitation is a very important thing. Uh, because you can get sick because when bacteria and other things happen because of unsanitary conditions or you have, you know, vermin coming in because they're attracted to maybe food left out and things like that. It is very important to make sure you keep your surfaces clean, but also keep your hands washed and you need to wash your hands with water that you would drink, not necessarily go down to the creek, wash your hands and wash your face. You know, you need to have that same water for that. Okay, what have we got? Uh, Gail uh, Coombs asks, does boiling water take out chemicals like from farm runoffs? Yeah, yeah, that may be, it's according to what it is. I mean, if the, if the um, you know, pesticides, things like that, you know, it may or may not. Uh, I guess it's according to the pesticide. Sometimes a lot of a lot of farms use more natural type pesticides, and that would probably be a better option. But uh, I don't know. That's something that uh, we'd probably have to look up. And honestly, that is a problem. I know I, know I have a buddy of mine that lives. Uh, in fact, I, we lived up in the western part of North Carolina, and he was uh, kayaking one time down the French Broad River, and they got to a certain place, and there was a dead cow in the in the river, and he had been there for a while. And that water is going down. And if you get water and you drink it, it's one of the things that happened on the uh, Oregon Trail is a lot of people got sick because they didn't dead bodies even were left in water, animals, runoff, people using the bathroom, things like that. And so that's one of the reasons why depending on natural water sources can be dangerous. Uh, the Titan Preparedness Channel says, just picked up the Grail suit. You've been using one for years. Have you had to replace the cartridge yet? No, I haven't. But yeah, those are those are great sources. I love the Grail. Uh, in fact, it's in my go bag right now. But you can take and fill up your water and just press. It's almost like a cappuccino press. And you just press it down and it filters the water into the container through the filter. It's a great resource. Yes. Uh, and I would highly recommend whatever filter system you have, you know, have backups. It was funny. My buddy that uh, the Berkey guy who I got this original Berkey from, he told me one time he was kind of laughing. He said, um, you know, people buy extra filters. But he said, I mean, these things last forever. We have changed the filters in this because we use it every day. You don't use it every day. But if you're using water that has any kind of contaminants in it, you're definitely going to run those filters dry earlier. And the way you know it is, it just starts to produce less and less fresh water. Uh, Philip Calvin asks, hello, does anybody use the Sawyer filters? They look pretty decent. Sawyer filters are great. Sawyer Mini is great. A lot of people really like the Sawyer Mini for a get home bag or a go bag. Uh, I like it because it also has the little bag with it, which is a container. So, uh, yeah, I highly recommend those. The uh, MSR filter systems, the Katadyne. But again, those are great and you need to have something, but honestly, you need to ramp it up a little bit or you're going to end up boiling and putting bleach in your water and using other ways to treat it because there's only those, those filters are limited. Uh, I think this little uh, filter straw here will filter 11 gallons and that, that doesn't take long to go through that. I think the pro is 22 gallons. I'm not sure about the life straw. I can't remember right off my, right off my head, but, um, Yes, those are definitely great sources and it's great to have. But if you're thinking about a family and you need to have water and you may have it over an extended period of time, you really need to think outside of just small filters. Uh, Kevin Dorr asks, do those filter straws have a shelf life? Uh, yeah, but if you keep them in good condition and you keep them in, you know, keep them stored away, uh, they should last pretty much as long as it doesn't get tainted by, you know, sunlight and temperature changes. Uh, but I'm sure they do, and I'm sure it's on the package. Uh, Raptor Crazy asks, question, the big water container, the metal one, can you wrap that in bubble wrap to help insulate during the winter? 
Yes. Yes. And that's a great idea. You could probably put some kind of foam insulation around it, uh, especially if your power's out. And that is a great point. Even when it gets really hot, uh, you don't want this to get really hot. One thing that the uh, pioneers did, uh, again, Oregon Trail, because I did a video on that, <laughs> is they would take some of their items that were sensitive to heat, like eggs for that matter, or uh, even salted meats, and they would put them in a barrel of bran, and the bran would go around it, and it would insulate it from the heat. So yeah, doing some kind of insulation would definitely help. It would probably help with your water. And one thing about like water like this, you don't want to set it out to where it gets sunlight. You want to put it somewhere in a dark, definitely a, or preferably a closet or some kind of thing. And you don't want this to be, you know, hot, cold, like out in a shed somewhere. So you want this to be as temperature controlled as possible. Now, if your power goes out, you can't do that. But still, keeping it in the dark is important. And another thing, again, is, is when you open this up, if it's been sitting for a while, pour it into a container. It oxygenates the water. And when you think about it, this water has been on this earth since the beginning of time. It's just been filtered through. So water doesn't necessarily go bad. Sometimes, though, you need to treat it. Uh, the Titan Preparedness Channel asks, what did you do for the algae outbreak in Anderson a few years ago, or did it affect your community? No, it didn't affect our community, but definitely that is, uh, it did affect our pool. <laughs> in fact, it really affected. It was, it was a lot of work to keep our pool up. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, we did experience some of it, but not with our drinking water. But, uh, you know, that is something to consider. Again, pre-filtering, and then I'm sure the big Berkey would handle that. It can about handle anything. Uh, in fact, even you could take a Coke, uh, a Coca-Cola, and pour in there, and it'll filter out the water. And that's pretty impressive. Now, if you want to do something like that, it's going to take a toll on your filters over time. So the purer the water, the longer your filter systems are going to work. Same thing with your filter straws. The less contaminants, the less debris in the water, the longer these filters will work. Uh, Joe from uh, Joe Central Texas says, um, I add bleach and colloidal silver to my water storage. Do you? Well, let me tell you this. We use colloidal silver. We make our own colloidal silver. And people have been using colloidal or silver. Uh, from the beginning of time, as long as when silver became, they, they realized the medicinal pr the properties of silver. And uh, there is a lot of backlash with the, with the modern medical communities, but even the ancient Chinese, the Egyptians, the Greeks, they a lot of times would use uh, silver containers to put water and especially milk. It would keep milk for a lot longer. Uh, the old West, people would take a silver coin and they would drop it down in their canteen. And would help. A lot of times baby bottles were made that were, were silver. In fact, from what I understand, silver flatware came from the medicinal advantages of silver. Now, too much silver is like anything. You know, it, it can cause some issues. But uh, for us, we have been using colloidal silver for 30 years. And it has, we have seen wonderful results around. Now, I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not trying to say that it is because there are some, um, you know, some issues with the medical associations. But uh, the point is there and it's been used from the beginning and it does help. Uh, P. River says, Don, I carry a sport Berkey with my get home. I saw a comment here about freezing issues. Have you run into that issue? No, but you could. I'm sure you could. And uh, it would probably have some effect on the filter system. Again, we'll go back to maybe insulating your cup. Uh, you know, if it's going to be out in your car, it's going to be in your go bag, especially where you are. I know uh, I know where you are. So, uh, yeah, when it gets wintertime and you have a lot of issues, that could be a problem. So uh, but keeping water in here. I, I typically don't keep water in my, uh, my containers if I can. Uh, I usually just now, yeah, well, sometimes I'll have a stainless steel container and I will keep it in that. But uh, the stainless steel, you can actually put it on a heat source and be able to, to warm that water. But yeah, I think with this plastic and the filter, I think keeping this water filled in here during the wintertime could, could be a problem. Could be. Um, survival Lieutenant, Survival Lieutenant says, how much chlorine can you use to purify your water? Okay, for one gallon of water, 
it's an eighth of a teaspoon. Or if you have droplet, you have something you can use droplets, it's eight droplets per gallon of water. Then you let it set for about 30 minutes. Um, let's see here. Alex Medeiros asks, how much water at one gallon a day should be stopped? I know as much as possible, but what would be a good starting point? Well, for me, uh, you know, with the filter systems, if you have filter systems, you know, that's going to give you for an extended period of time, more water and two water, you got to store it. This weighs eight gallons. It weighs like eight pounds for a gallon of water. And really, you know, you start stocking a bunch of these up, it takes up a lot of room. So I would stock up at least a couple of weeks worth of water. Uh, for us, we have a family of four here. Um, you know, so it, it get, kind of gets out of hand quickly. Uh, so you're thinking, you know, family of four, let's say we're going to go for two weeks. <laughs> and so that's four times per day per, you know, 14 days. So it can be a lot of water, but that's where having a filter system like this and guys, it's $250. And I know that these are only about a buck a piece, but if you start stocking up a lot of water, you're really putting a dent into the cost of this big Berkey. Uh, Dwight Turner asked, does sand filter water um, well enough to drink? No. Uh, sand, charcoal, grass. That's the traditional way to filter water. If you're in, you know, for like bushcrafters, uh, you take the sand, you take charcoal, and then you take grass, and then you can just pour it through. And then when it pull, pulls through, it should be, you know, better. And there are other ways to take care of water. One thing is, a lot of people put this water in the sun and the actual sun beating down on the water will kill a lot of the bacteria that's in here. Uh, but, you know, there are certain methods about that and you want to do your research before you really depend on that. But definitely using the sun to purify your water is a good possibility. It just takes some time. Uh, Lane McKenzie asks, what should I use for a 55 gallon drum of water? to treat in for long-term storage? That's a great question. And we're going to, we're going to, well, we're going to get ahead, but that's great. Um, one thing that we do is we have rain catchment systems and we have 50 gallon jug, 50 gallon, actually food grade, 50 gallon blue containers. And we have the water comes off of our, our, our gutter system. And so, in fact, we're redoing that whole thing right now. Uh, we've had a system set up. It's really great. Uh, but when you get the water out, uh, we have a spigot at the bottom and you can just turn it and it pours the water out. We also have a, an outlet. So if the barrel fills up, we have a relief valve where it just pours out and you can attach a hose to it and put it wherever you want to. Uh, but we don't treat the water in the barrel. We treat the water once it comes out. And I'm going to tell you something about rainwater, guys. Uh, you know, one thing that we, we're so used to tap water, we're so used to, you know, regular water, even, even this kind of water that's purified supposedly in natural spring water. But if you take a tap and you turn on rainwater, it has a unique, incredible smell to it. It is so fresh. And so we really like, that is really our main water source if things go bad. Uh, in fact, what we're doing in the front of the house right now, we're changing things out to where we're putting in wine barrels. They're actually wine barrels and we're putting them. We've got all the adapters. In fact, we should have them here in the next day or two. We're going to put them around the front of the house just because they look nice. And then at the back of the house, we have the blue barrels that we're, we're setting up through our gutter system. In fact, we had gutters, new gutters put up. And when I did, I told him, I said, this is what we want to do. And he was like, oh yeah, we can do that. He'd already done this before. And so he set the gutter spout to be at the right height for us to be able to attach it. But I've attached gutters before and run that system. And you can get all the different things from Lowe's, in fact, uh, or Home Depot. In fact, here in Greenville area where I live, uh, there is a place that actually has barrels, has attachments, has the spigots, has everything you can do, it has a kit that you can just set up and you can use as your water system. Guys, to me, rainwater. Now, let me just say this. There are some places, especially out west, where it's illegal, <laughs> which is just so crazy. It's illegal to harvest rainwater. So that to me, though, especially if I was out there where the, the area right now where it's really hot and arid, any kind of rain, I would love to be able to at least have some water put back. 
Uh, Silas Smedley asks, what is the best compact water filter to take to a third world country? Yeah, well, see, that's a that's a whole other problem. A lot of people do now, like the Life Straw. The Life Straw to me is is fine. There are some things about it that I'm not really super happy about. We do have some of these. I really prefer maybe something like this. This will filter uh, 30 or 22 gallons of water, I think it is. Uh, but taking something like the Sawyer Mini or something like that, you you space is definitely a problem. And so that's one thing that you want to. Um, you know, make sure that you have, but um, sometimes in different countries, just like with bleach, uh, it, unscented bleach, de definitely unscented. Uh, one thing about it is that in other countries, I think this is like 3%, nine, up to 9% effective ingredient. And it's some kind of um, sodium chlor chlorine or something. Uh, I had the name written down there, but I, I don't see it. But uh, sometimes in other countries, it's down to 1%. So you need, if you're going to use something like this, you need to have at least 3%. Let me see if I can see it on here. Bop, bop, bop. I don't see it. But when you look for the active ingredient in bleach, look for that. And it needs to be at least 3 to 9% for an eighth of a teaspoon or eight little droplets. Uh, when it gets that, in fact, you can go to the, I believe it's the FDA or FEMA, you can even go to FEMA and look up treating water. There's a lot of information there. Some of this information I got from there because I wanted some technical details, but you can go there. It's a great resource. Uh, Gail Coombs asks, how do you know if the filter goes bad just by getting sick? No. Um, typically, you know, the one thing you don't want to do is to take this hiking or going out somewhere and using it and then leaving it. Mold will set up is the big, probably the biggest thing. Uh, you could have some breakdown in the filters, but main thing is, is you want to take it and pull your filter out. Like this one has a small little, um, in fact, let me see if it's on this. Yeah. yeah, here's the little tube you suck from. And inside here, there's a little pad and there's extras they, they send with them. It's just looks like a little cotton little round. And so it'll fit down in it. And uh, you want to make sure that you take that out and let it air dry and let your system dry whenever you use it. If you do that and you pack it back up once it's dry, it'll last for a long time. But you can look on the packaging uh, when you're choosing your filter straw or, or whatever filter system you want to use. And it will say what the shelf life is and things like that. There's so many different ones too. So it's, it's hard to keep up with which is which. Oh, the Berkey. The Berkey will last as long as you, what we typically do is we'll, we'll fill it up we, we use it, use it, use it. And then after a certain period of time, we just monitor it and look. And usually we know because it starts to slow down just a little bit. It's not quite as fast as it was. So we take the filters out, take them through rushing, you know, running water and just, you know, rub them off, rub off any kind of, <coughs> excuse me, any kind of little sediment or anything that may be growing there. But typically it's, we, this, these are very low maintenance. Uh, and then if it gets to the point where you've cleaned them a few times and it's still just really slow, it's time to buy some new filters. Uh, I think they're running about 50 bucks a piece, but $50 for 3000 gallons of water is a really cheap price and a great investment. Uh, John Doe asks, how about filtering water through a still boiling water and running it through a cooling cold? AKA worm and then dripping out into a bucket or other container. Yes, that would be a, that's a great way to do it. I mean, that, that kind of is, it's, it's redundant, but yet it really will make sure that your water is in good sort, good shape. Uh, Tony Sands asked, can I use splash proof formula bleach? What's the shelf life for bleach? Uh, bleach. I don't know. Um, that, I'm sure it's on the packaging, but um, yeah, don't know. Uh, Justin Hopkins asks, have you tested the zero water system? No, no, I haven't. Um, and we try to try a lot of different filter systems. We have a lot of different filter systems, which can make it difficult to know all the details because sometimes, you know, there's so many different things. And that's one of the things, guys, you know, this is more of a general. These are some things you need to do. If, when you get ready to pick what you're doing, do your research. Uh, you know, check out these things. If you're looking at a filter, you know, I mean, there is a lot of information on here. There's a lot of information online. There is a lot of information on the Berkey website. I mean, you can find out all kind of things. 99.99% of all the different cryptosporidiums, Yardia, metals, 
you know, all kind of different things that you, you just don't want in your body. And the Berkey has been tested in a, no, a lot of different ways. A uh, very friend asks, um, I live on a lake and have a water softer for the hard water. Even with the water being filtered, is it okay to drink due to the softener salt? Uh, well, you know, let me tell you this. A lot of times you can have your water tested. And I would highly recommend that when we lived in Brevard, uh, we had a, a well system and we would have it tested, you know, on occasion to make sure and you'd send it off. Uh, in fact, I think there was a water place there that you could drop your water off. They would test it for you. So locally, especially in something like that, uh, I would have that water tested and they can give you all the information. They can even tell you what you need to do to make this water more drinkable. And so that, those are resources that are just awesome to have. Unfortunately, here we are on a rock bed. I mean, it is solid rock. We were even going to have a, we were going to build a, a really nice uh, basement a while back, and there was just no way to do it because the rock was so thick. And so that's one thing. But one thing that we do have is a natural spring. So let's let's get into. We're going to get back to some questions. Let's get into um, let's get into a few things too, because there are some other things that I really want you to consider not just your water filtrations. Uh, number one, well, let's say you have a, a well. Uh, for us, we had an electric well. If the power goes out, we were out of water. I mean, we were just out of water <laughs> and we had a well. So um, one thing is to have a hand pump attached to your well. And you can talk to the people that, 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 that uh, dig wells, that install wells, and you can find out, or you can do some research but uh, having a, a well, a hand pump on your well to me is super important. In fact, a buddy of mine just had his hand pump. In fact, I think it was Engineer 775 came up and uh, buddy of mine, Scott, he's a great resource, by the way. And um, he uh, he took and went from the well and had a pump system to where it was right there in his house. So they can go if they had any kind of power outage and their well was out. They can hand pump their water and it's actually he said it was actually a lot easier than he thought it was going to be. So having some kind of hand pump also, you know, having a hand pump and we'll get into this in a minute. But transporting water, if you don't have water available around you and you have to go get water, you're having some kind of hand pump or some kind of way to pump the water into containers is going to be vital. So pumps are, fun, are great now. One thing we have here is a natural spring. We have a beautiful stream that runs on the border of our property, but we have a um, natural spring that feeds down into that, that place. And that's one of the things about a natural spring. Typically the water is fresh. Uh, it's actually able to drink again. We want to have it tested, uh, but we're in the process right now of developing that spring to be able to get that water, pump it up to us and have that water available. Uh, and then really we have two springs. So we've got another one on the other side of the property. So knowing those kind of things, you know, you may not have property, you may live in an apartment. Well, then again, you know, you could still suffer from having water because municipal water can be uh, messed up. Okay. Let's see. Then there's wells. There's uh, okay. So we've got the filter system, rain catchment system, you got your creeks, your rivers, your streams. I have a list of here, by the way. I'm just kind of checking it. Um, now, let's talk about transporting water. Uh, let's say that you do know where you have a, a you live in a house. In fact, I have a buddy of mine who lives in a really nice subdivision. And one of the things he said was, he goes, well, about a mile down this way, we have a, a beautiful river. He goes, so we've got a water source. Well, that's great, but you need to have some way to transport the water. Uh, whether you have buckets, whether you have gallon jugs, whether you have one of those big water containers with the metal cage around it. A lot of guys use those to be able to do pressure washing and they'll fill up those with water and they can drive it around their truck. But you want to have a way to be able to transport water from a water source to your house. Our pool, which is about 60 feet, or that's probably farther than that, it's probably about 80 feet out. It's, I can see it. It's right there but I've got to be able to transport that water to my house. And we've all seen the pictures, especially in Africa or in the sub-Saharan desert area or whatever, of people with poles and with buckets and they're carrying water or they're carrying water on their head. That is the natural place that you need to think about. What, how are you going to be able to transport the water? Even if you have vehicles, which are fine, and you drive down to that water source, 
typically it's not right there. So you're, you're going to have to have some way to, to get that water out of the water source and then into a vehicle and then from there home. But if you have to walk with that water, that's going to be a whole nother ball game. And so you need to think about having pails and buckets and ways to be able to transport water. Uh, you don't want to run down to the creek and have a bunch of water bottles and try to fill them up because that's just going to be a nightmare. So having some different ways to be able to do it. And again, if you have some kind of container and, and water is about eight pounds per gallon, give or take. So it's going to be heavy. And so you need to figure out how you're going to transport that water. The other thing about a water source is there could be security issues. If things are getting kind of hairy and people are doing bad things, which we've seen a lot of times in the, the uh, urban areas and suburban areas, is that you need to think about how to get down to that water safely and securely. So just some things to think about. All right, let's go back to some questions because I think questions are vital because people, you know, hopefully we'll give you some answers or at least give me some answers. Uh, TJ Lean Houts asks, can expired gallon jugs of water then be ran through the Berkey filter? Yes. Yes, they can. And another thing again is you take your water. Let's say this gallon jug has been sitting for a long time. Uh, it was in good condition. You know, one thing about sunlight is it will create algae in your water. So you, you want to make sure that it's in dark. But let's say this water's been sitting for a long time. I have a little bit of some question about it. I open it up. I pour it into another container. Uh, and then I, you can pour it back and forth. But yeah, if you have some kind of, if you do have a little doubt, you can run it through the Berkey for sure. And with this water, it's going to be fairly clean water. You're not going to have any kind of contaminants. So you're able to get rid of any kind of bacteria. And again, you can boil it. You can boil it for about 30 seconds. Uh, Walt asks, why do you use the, the Berkey filter every day? Well, uh, it's just funny. We, we set up the Berkey. And, uh, and my review on this was, again, I think it was 10 years ago, maybe longer. And so we just started running water through it and we would use it. Well, the water was so much better than the tap water. I mean, phenomenally better. It's just really, it tastes really great. There's no taste. And that's the great part. <laughs> but you go to your water field, your, your regular tap water and you run it. And the funny thing is here in Greenville, South Carolina, at one point, we had the best water in the world or at least in the United States. And because of all the EPA regulations and all the other, you know, FDA and all that, they have completely ruined the water system because they're dumping so many chemicals in it. Again, I can go over to my pool, which we don't use chlorine in our pool anyway. We use something else. It's more natural. But I can go over to my water, my pool and drink out of that. And it's less chlorine than it is in the water system that we get, that where we get our water. So the big Berkey making tea, water, we cook with it. We do all that. We make our ice with it. Uh, you know, it, it's just a great way to be able to filter water. But in a survival situation, this to me is the best option because you've got that water that's continually running. You've got just with this small one, which this is the big Berkey. But and there are smaller ones, by the way. In fact, if you don't really don't have room for this, there is the travel Berkey, which is a little one filter with a little stainless system. And it's great as well. Uh, DZ Ren asks, where is a good place to get food grade drums to store rainwater? I was looking for used preferably. You know, it was funny a few years ago when I built my first rain catchment system, uh, there was a Tropicana plant in our area. And a buddy of mine told me, he said, hey, they have barrels. When I first went to get the barrels, they smelled like apple juice. I mean, it was wonderful. You open it up, you're like, oh, man, that smells really. And it was fresh. It was really good. Uh, I bought some barrels later on and wasn't really sure about what they kept in it. I ended up not using them. In fact, at my shooting range, I keep them down there. So uh, you can get online. There are places. In fact, like I said, there's a place here in our town, Greenville, South Carolina, that they actually have water barrels available. They're brand new and they have all the fixtures to set them up as a rain catchment. Or you may just want to take your hose and fill it up just to have water portable. Uh, I would keep that at least in my garage. But even then, you know, temperature controls a little bit out. Uh, Tony Sands asks, bleach, should we avoid the splash proof formula? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's, I, you know, I'd have to look at the, the exact specs on it. Uh, but to me, I just like the unscented bleach. And uh, but and unless it's a chemical difference, 
unless there's some kind of difference to it. I, I don't see why it would, but I'll tell you this. If it, if you, you can look on the bottle and it should say something about it. It should mention that because this is a known way to treat water with bleach. And again, it's on the FEMA website. They're on the FDA, a lot of the Red Cross. There's a lot of information about using bleach, about boiling water, about using iodine pills. Those are basics. And they've been around for a long time. Uh, Team Palmer asks, any thoughts on the sure water or water prepared systems? Appreciate all you've done and do for the preparedness space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't. I, I'm not a, I'm not aware of it. Um, it would be something good to look into because water, again, is so vital. So, um, you know, usually do your research and there are always good reviews out there. So um, we'll make a note and check them out. Uh, Silas Medley asks, would you trust a hand dug well? Um, yeah, here's the thing about whales, typically, unless you have some kind of seepage or something, uh, this is what I would do. I think traditionally a hand dug well is fine. Man's been using hand dug wells from the beginning, the very beginning. But I would take that because of the different chemicals and the things, and I don't know about what surrounds your area. What I would do is, is take that water, have it tested. I mean, that to me, and again, there is a ton of different resources to have it tested. Even in each county should be some kind of way to test your water. A lot of times, especially in agriculture areas, there, there's these, uh, you know, farm associations and things like that that will help you with that. Um, Nidavlier Forge and Woodcraft ask, do you have a Berkey rebate code? No, I don't. No. I wish. When I bought my Imperial... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have one for that, <laughs> but I just wanted it because I just, we really like the Berkey. Uh, but Jim, thank you. Jim Bevesky asks, I live near salt water. How is the best way to filter? Yeah, it's tough. You know, as long as it's not really salt, it could be brackish water sometimes. Um, I think again, boiling water, as long as it's fresh water, uh, it may have a little bit of a salt flavor to it, you know, but typically brackish is not, I mean, it does have some, um, not living next to the coast. But, you know, I would, you're going to have to do some research. But I think that typically if you boil your water, I think that would be a big one. I think the Berkey would take care of a lot of that. It's not going to take a lot of heavy salt because salt water, that's a whole nother process. Uh, but I think boiling water actually, and then you can pull the top off of the, you know, in case the salt would actually flow to the bottom. So it seems to me, but that that's a whole nother ball game. And I don't want to give you some direct advice on that. But, um. Uh, I'm sure that, I mean, people have been living on the coast way before they had water systems. Um, I'd rather be camping and ask, can you drink water from a large fish tank if you have to? Sure. It tastes horrible. Well, typically the kind of water that you use for your fish, you know, for your fish, but still I would filter that water um, just because of different bacteria that could set up. Another thing that you can do is you can take your hot water heater, Typically the tank there is good potable water and you can actually open it up in case the power goes out and you can drain the water and it's potable. Uh, the water in your tank on your toilet on the back tank is potable water. Uh, it's something, you know, that's not really sanitary conditions in your tank necessarily, but definitely water that you can drink. Just don't drink out of the bowl. <laughs> but, you know, even water that you, you know, runoff water that you not necessarily run off water. I mean, you still want to filter it. But even having just an open barrel that collects rainwater, uh, as long as you keep mosquitoes out, uh, you know, that that can also be a source. But again, uh, you know, with it just open to the outdoors, you could probably drink it if it's rainwater. Uh, but, you know, years ago, I remember when they used to have the acid rain and they had some other things. If you live near a heavy uh, industrial area, you know, it could cause some issues. So, again, guys, if you have any kind of questions about certain type of waters, again, take it and have it tested. Just have it tested. You can find out a lot that way. and It'll give you a lot more confidence. So then in a grid down situation, you'll know one way or the other. Uh, Gina Smith asks question, where can I purchase the Berkey filter from? Uh, there's a ton of places online. The guy that uh, I've been buying Berkey's from, in fact, I, I know him pretty well. Um, the Berkey guy is, and I think that's, I think that's his, his, uh, his websites, the Berkey guy, or you can put the Berkey guy and a uh, great, 
great guy. And uh, he really knows the Berkey. And again, I bought that one. Or actually, he he furnished the first Berkey, this one, for me. And I did a review for him. Uh, and then I bought the Imperial just off his website. And then he got in touch with me and said, man, he goes, I would at least give you a little discount. And I was like, man, I just wanted that. I just wanted it. <laughs> so uh, uh, to me, and I'm going to tell you guys, been doing this a long time. And I'm not, I'm not making a dime off this now. I mean, this is like, again, this was given to me 10 years ago, but I don't make any, any money off these. I believe in these. I mean, I, I think that it's a great investment. And again, it's a couple hundred bucks, but man, it's peace of mind. Uh, Timothy Hamilton asks, how good is your Berkey water filter compared to water filters by cities like Chicago's water filter system? I've been to Chicago. I drink their water. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's high tech and they put a lot of money into it. But um, typically they still have to treat it. They treat it with a lot of chemicals. They treat it with a lot of things. So to me, even here in Greenville, which has a really good water system, this makes it better. Now, if I sit here and compare a glass of water from Chicago municipal water system to this, no, but I can tell you right now that 99.9% .9 assurity that this would be a better water source. But you know, if you've got water and it's good to drink, then you're fine. But this is mainly for if the water shuts down. What do you do? Um, Such, how do I persuade my girlfriend back into preparing? She was all for it before we moved to our new house, but now she doesn't want to. And me, not, uh, she doesn't want me to not uh, to prepare anymore. That is the age old question when it comes to prepping. And it's either the, it's typically the wife because the guy gets into prepping because he wants to have all the, the, the guns and the camping gear and the stuff. And, you know, and, and sometimes what happens is, is the wives kind of look back and they're like, man, you know, he's having a, a male thing. Um, one thing that my buddy did for you, he was a prepper for years and his wife really wasn't on board and uh, he just continued to prep. He just did what he did. He said, that's fine. I'm on, I'm still going to prep because, you know, I see the need and I'm going to prepare for me and my family. So one thing I think is one of the biggest things not to do is to be on them about it and talk about it all the time. And because a lot of people will shut down and they just won't do anything. So they don't want to hear about it. And so we have a prepper group. We have about 30 people in it. Uh, half the wives before weren't on board. Now, all of them are on board because we just kind of work together. And, you know, if you have friends that are preppers and if their wife is a prepper, their girlfriend's open to preparedness, sometimes they can help influence her. But with all the stuff that happened at the beginning of 2020, uh, you know, it's really it's the easiest time ever to get someone into prepping because we've saw we saw what happened. But let me say this, guys, we are facing a lot of food shortages coming up uh, with labor shortages because of COVID-19, because of the pandemic and also because of the huge drought that's happening right now in the West. And also and I read this on the AP, this isn't some side news source. They're having a locust or a grasshopper plague right now that they're trying to keep under control, which typically happens when you have a drought because they just tend to come out and they can decimate the crops. Also, uh, and I'd heard this statistic recently is there are the, the U.S. trucking industry is short 90,000 drivers, 90,000 drivers. That's transportation. So. My point is, is we could be looking coming up this late summer, early fall. We could be coming up with some food shortages, which could lead to other things. So just make sure, guys, don't don't lose heart, but just tell her. Say, you know what? I love you. Respect you and all that. But I'm going to continue to prep and just don't talk to her about it a lot. Just do it. That's that's my that's the only advice I know to give you. Um, Tony Sands asks, what are your thoughts on the water bob or other bathtub liners? I think those are great. Um, yeah. I, the, one thing about, too, like whenever we'd have a storm coming up where we thought we might have a power outage, we would fill our tubs up with water. We just fill them all up. 
Uh, and it's great for not only being able to have water, but also if you need to flush the toilet, you know, you can just take and pour it in there and it'll flush the toilet. Uh, but yeah, having water bobs, that's a great idea. That's a great thing to have. Um, the Maverick Prepper asks, what's the best type of chlorine for long-term storage? Well, you know, it, the, the big thing is, is the active ingredient in your bleach. Of course, unscented. Uh, this is just generic bleach. You know, it's funny. One thing I've learned over the years is that quality, uh, sometimes, sometimes, hey Zane, quality sometimes uh, is dictated by really a company that's reputable. And sometimes the, these, these products are made in the same factory. I mean, Clorox may be making this, I don't know. And then this company, um, which is one of the local grocery stores has it bottled and they put their label on it, but I don't know that. But I've found over the years that a lot of times generic products are a little bit inferior. I mean, they just are. Uh, and so maybe it's on design. They change things a little bit. But the big thing is, is you want to look for, and again, that word is the, uh, it's, uh, what is it? I had it written down. Anyway, it's 9%, 3 to 9% active ingredient that's in bleach that actually will affect the water. So you want to make sure that that percentage is at a decent level. Uh, but everything else really with bleach, it should be pretty level. So I don't really have a name, you know, say, well, hey, Clorox bleach is the one to buy. But uh you know, as far as looking and doing the research from all the different with FDA, FEMA, all those places, they just mention bleach. So I think it, it would take care of whatever you were looking for. If that's your question. Chlorine. Chlorine. Is that the, is that the, is that what the, that was con right. the chlorine content? Or the type of chlorine. Ah. Uh, Stephen Duncan asked question. What do you think about the powdered form of bleach like pool shock? Well, pool shock's pretty heavy. Uh, we've used pool shock. We have. We don't. We quit using it. We used to use it. Uh, we got. We've gone to something else. My wife did a bunch of research and went to something. That, and the pool has a lot less irritation. And so that's one thing about it. I think that Clorox or, or bleach is more of a milder. I think when you get into pool shock, you can look at the percentages of the active ingredient in it. And if it's over 9%, then I don't think it would be good to use. Plus, it's not really food grade. But on the other hand, we get into that water. They know you're going to be in, ingesting some of it when you're swimming and you're doing things. It's going up your nose. It's going to those places. But it is a really large body of water. So it's possible. Uh, I'd, I'd have to do research to say one way or the other. But to think about it, I think it would probably work. Uh, Hopeful Healing asks, does the Berkey filter out minerals? Is it important to keep the minerals in the water? Uh, it doesn't filter out all the minerals. It, it, it the heavy metals, the heavy metals that you really don't need in your body. Uh, but no, it. And again, you can look through the research on the Berkey website. There's a lot of information. But from what all I have researched, and I have done quite a bit of research on this in the past, is that it is just one of the best systems out there. Uh, you can get it to where you can buy the filters, and you can just use PVC you know, food grade PVC little um, like buckets, white buckets and things like, I mean, they've got systems you can set up that'll be cheaper. So, uh, you know, it may be something I really like the stainless though, because it does not get embedded like PVC would with any kind of contaminants. So the stainless tends to be a little bit more sanitary and clean and it's easier to clean. Okay. Are we at the time? We are at one minute. Okay. So we're at one minute guys again, the rule of threes, you have three days without water to live and your body starts to break down. Please look into taking care of your water sources. Look to be able to either treat your water, to filter your water. Think about your water sources and how you're going to transport your water. Again, there's a number of different ways you can do it. And guys, if nothing else, locate a water source near you. Uh, typically water sources are at the lower points, but if you like in our area, it's just, there's water all around, but it can be all around, but if you don't filter it, you can get really, really sick and you can die. So make sure that you have the means to be able to treat your water. If for nothing else, boil your water. So that, I mean, to me, it's not really something that's expensive to do, 
But if you really want to do it right, again, the big Berkey to me is hands down the best out there. The other sources, we have the knowledge, we know how to do it. If something were to happen to this Berkey, we'd have to figure that out. I don't want to figure it out in a grid down situation. So have your water sources, boiling, chlorine, uh, or bleach. Bleach is one of the best ways. And then again, just stock up on some water. And at least it'll get you through till you can make other decisions. So guys, I hope that helped. Uh, again, it's super vital. Thanks for all the questions. Really good, thought-provoking questions. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, don't forget about the Sportsman's Guide. In fact, they have different type filters on there and different things. Uh, a great resource for preppers, but also just for sportsmen, for shooting, for hunting, fishing, camping, outdoors, whatever. I mean, they've been around for at least 50 years because I've been getting Sportsman's Guide catalogs when I was just a kid. And uh, just a great resource, $20 off every $100 or more purchase. You join their buyer's club, you get free shipping, and you get a cheaper discount. No free shipping on ammo, though. Sorry, guys. So we're going to head out. Thanks again. Be strong. Be of good courage. God bless America. Long live the Republic.